grew up in South Florida, but I came back to Atlanta to go to college at Emory in 1975. Started playing at parties on campus, and, and it was great to be in Atlanta in the, in the 70s. All the bands would come through and play at places like Southeast Music Hall, and we would sit cross-legged on the floor and watch people like Muddy Waters and Howlin' Wolf and B.B. King, and I, I was at all of those shows. and. Uh, so I really started playing as a hobby in high school and college, and then by the time I was in my senior year at Emory, it was a wonder that I graduated. I was playing so often. And then, of course, I got out of college and joined the Alley Cats, and they were a, um, a band led by Albie Scholl, and they had had a chance to uh, open for people like Muddy Waters, and so I was really impressed with that, and they actually knew Muddy Waters, if you can imagine that. I can't imagine what that would be like. but. Uh, so I, uh, when I graduated from, from Emory, uh, I joined the Alley Cats and went immediately on the road with them. And we had a seven, seven guys on the road and sometimes we made such a little amount of money that we'd get one hotel room. So you have seven men in a one, one, one hotel room all over the East Coast night after night. And we stayed at people's houses and stuff like that. And you know, I was a much younger man then. I couldn't do that now. but. Uh, I moved in with Albie here in Little Five Points up on Sterling Road and he has still to this day the most amazing blues record collection I've ever seen. And so he actually made me sit down and learn Freddie King guitar solos and learn the difference between um, Robert Jr. Lockwood type playing and uh, you know and really uh, I don't know where you would get an education like that there's the internet and stuff like that people can learn nowadays but back in my era if you wanted to learn something you had to find some older guy like that and maybe they would show you a few things so what a what an education and uh, and then I hooked up with Chicago Bob Nelson and the and formed the Hard Fixers and he had the same type of experience but he had actually played with Muddy and he played with Helen Wolf and he played with John Lee Hooker and James Cotton and I mean the education these guys would give and sometimes just in the form of you be up there on stage playing and they turn and look at you and give you the hairy eyeball you know <laughs> and that means you know they don't like what you're playing so I got the hairy eyeball and I developed one of my own which I use hopefully not too often but uh Basically, that's a great education, and it's all about apprenticeship. This was in the 70s, late 70s, when there was no blues scene at all. There was no Stevie Ray Vaughan, and it was after the Allman Brothers had been uh, you know, big. And so it's really kind of in between years. It was really a struggle. So I always like to say that we played blues because we liked the music. There was no money in it that was ever going to made. Nowadays you get into it because there's been somebody like a Stevie Ray Vaughan or a Kenny Wayne Shepherd or Johnny Lang who has had hit songs. But none of that existed when I first started playing in the late 70s and playing in blues bands. So the whole blues thing started with me, of course, with the British invasion. I had listened to the Yardbirds and Cream and, and the Rolling Stones, of course, and I, I knew I loved that kind of music. I just didn't know that it, was, that it had a name. I didn't know that it was blues, and I didn't know that, that they didn't come up with it. And so I was at a friend's house, and his older brother came in and said, there's a guy you gotta go see, because he's the one they're all getting it from. And he said, you gotta go see B.B. King. And so it came at a time where uh, where B.B. King was playing week-long engagements at uh, hotel lounges. So he was playing in North Miami Beach at a place called the Marco Polo Hotel in the lounge. And this place held maybe 150 people. He played there every night of the week. B.B. King put on an amazing show and all of a sudden I could see where Dwayne Allman and Eric Clapton and Mike Bloomfield and Johnny Winter were coming from. It was just a real turning point in my music listening and appreciation. Overflow. 
I never really thought it would go this far. I thought maybe I'd snap out of it or something, but it started off just sort of me partying and entertaining my friends, and, uh, and then it turned into a occupation. And, uh, and then it turned into something that I better not stop doing because it's all I do. So I never really thought that, uh, I thought I would play around, maybe, you know, tour around, but I never thought I would have 20 albums out or get with Alligator Records, for instance, because they didn't seem, they didn't have anybody on their roster in the 70s that looked like me. They didn't have anybody out from outside of Chicago, really, except for maybe Professor Longhair. And you know, it's really great to be from Georgia because everybody wants to sound like they're from Georgia, but I actually am from Georgia, so I got that going for me. And um, you know, to play Southern music in places where people just, they want to know everything I know about the Allman Brothers Band, or everything that I could tell them about James Brown. They had asked at one point, they'd asked James Brown, what his definition of soul was. And James Brown said, uh, soul is being comfortable with where you came from. So I'm a proud Georgia artist. My friends move away to Nashville. They do really well, but I'm staying here.